Sarah, and this is Budget Sew, where we create stylish, fashionable looks as inexpensively as possible. Today, I'm going to show you my Victoria Day craft. It's a stenciled crown pillow, but first, I'm going to show you one of my makes. Today, I'm wearing Vogue 8408 View B in a size 16. Vogue 8408 is a dress and belt pattern published in 2007. This princess seamed dress has an oversized collar, top stitching, and back slits. View A is sleeveless and View B has long sleeves. There are optional trims including buttons and buttonhole stitches. The tie belt has top stitching as well. I bought this pattern in 2007 from Fabricland. The dress is a lovely large houndstooth print in black, brown, and white. I bought this knit fabric at Fabricland in the clearance section for the very low price of $1.75 a meter. I bought the last of the bolt for a total of 3.7 meters. The remaining fabric was used to make the skirt and top of Vogue designer pattern 2867. The link to the video with the skirt and top is right here at the top of the screen. Before cutting the pattern out of fabric, I lengthen the skirt by 22 centimeters so that it now falls below the knee. I feel much more comfortable in long skirts lately. I also replace the slits in the back of the skirt with kick pleats. If you would like to see how I draw and attach a kick pleat to my patterns, the link to the video is right here at the top of the screen. The pattern called for a side zipper, but since my dress was made from a knit fabric, I did not add it. I didn't think it was necessary. View B, the long sleeve version, calls for four buttons and four buttonholes on the collar, but my buttons were not very noticeable because of the large houndstooth print of the fabric, so I didn't add them. Originally, I made the belt out of the same houndstooth fabric as the dress, but I just didn't like the look of it, so I cut the belt out again, but this time from a black knit remnant. When sewing the dress together, my sewing machine struggled to sew the collar to the dress due to the multiple layers of fabric, interfacing, and facings, but my vintage Kenmore is a tank, and she managed to sew through it all. The instructions for this very easy Vogue pattern were very clear and easy to follow, and my pattern modifications were quite simple. The dress is comfy and elegant all at the same time. To complete the look, I'm wearing Joey New York high heels that I bought at Value Village Thrift Store. My Mia and Luca black leather purse was also from Value Village. My brooch was a gift from a friend. I bought my Hugh brand pantyhose from the Hudson's Bay Company, and the hair clip was from Dollarama, a Canadian dollar store. My gold earrings were in a Ziploc bag full of jewelry that I bought for $5 at a church Christmas bazaar. Now, on to the Victoria Day craft. My non-Canadian subscribers might be wondering, what is Victoria Day? It's a holiday celebrated in Canada, and I think in Scotland, and began as a celebration to honor Queen Victoria's birthday. 
She was born on May 24th, 1819, and was Canada's reigning monarch for 63 years. We celebrate Victoria Day on May 24th if it's a Monday, otherwise it will be held on the Monday immediately before the 24th. Today, Victoria Day is a holiday celebrating our current reigning monarch, Queen Elizabeth II. And throughout most of Canada, it's marked with parades, outdoor events, and activities like camping and elaborate firework displays. So in honor of Victoria Day, I thought it would be fun to try out another craft from one of my McCall Needlework Annuals. Stenciling crafts are shown in all three of my McCall Needlework Annuals. The first edition details a stenciled Mexican border painted in peasant colors. You may remember this McCall's Needlework Annual. The link to that video is right here at the top of the screen. The Mexican border design on this page may be used to decorate a number of different articles. Stencil it on nursery curtains, pictured here on the opposite page, or on a luncheon cloth or placemats. It's cute on children's bibs or play suits, or as a border for a skirt. Hand stenciled guest towels or scarves make delightful gifts. These are all great ideas. Further on in this annual is this. Another fine craft is fabric stenciling. It says, women who have enjoyed beautifying their homes or making gifts out of plain materials will appreciate the art of stenciling. It will be a new experience to decorate your own fabrics with painted designs and you will add sparkle to your household, your wardrobe, and your children's things. Cottons, linens, rayons, or silk can be used but materials with a rough weave should not be used because it's difficult to manipulate the brush on the surface. There is no end to the ideas you will have for embellishing curtains, luncheon sets, blouses, and dresses. They all make fine gifts. Then in the second edition of McCall's Needlework Annual, there is a full lesson dedicated to stenciling. It says, this alphabet, especially designed for stenciling, has a utilitarian simplicity of modern art. And now your monograms on your blouses, accessories, gift wrappings, and linens for yourself or for gifts are certain to be arrestingly different once you begin to personalize these beautiful letters. The flowing outlines make them easy to trace, stencil cut, and print. On the next page, it shows the stenciled monograms on ties and t-shirts. It says, stencil a small fry's name on the front of his or her sport t-shirt with a modern monogram. Use a contrasting or blended scheme. Plain neckties in light colors become unusual and effective with subtle toned monograms for the fastidious, also the nonchalant. Large or small size letters, smartly combined, may be used to form single or repeat designs. One handkerchief shows large letter A's arranged in an uneven border around four large letter A's in the center. The second handkerchief shows small letters masked in a repeat pattern to cover the entire area. The monograms in both sizes are artistic and distinctive. The third edition of the McCall's Needlework Annual also has a lesson dedicated to stenciling on fabric. It says, no one can ever have too many of these. Pretty handkerchiefs for women, distinctive ties for men. Stencil these appealing flower motifs on fine linen hankies. Dot a man's silk tie with oak leaves or maple leaves. Beginner easy directions for stenciling are given below right down here. The annual has both single and multicolored stencil designs. For example, the leaves are single colored. Brown maple leaves were printed in a scatter effect on a white necktie and a golden brown necktie was decorated with tiny acorns and graceful oak leaves in a darker shade. The flowers use multicolored stencils. For example, 
the lily of the valley, with leaves in two shades of green, set off a pale green handkerchief, and also rust-colored chrysanthemums with shaded green leaves on a yellow handkerchief. The annual recommends all cottons, linens, rayons, and silk for stenciling fabric and suggests avoiding rough weaves because it's hard to manipulate a brush on them. For washable fabrics, first remove all sizing by washing in lukewarm water and soap sets so color will not be washed out. Silks, chiffons, and very fragile fabrics should be taped or pinned to a white blotter so that they will not stick to the stencil brushes. Heavy fabric need not be taped down. Unbleached cotton or the matte side of chintz takes stenciling very well. When stenciling, cut out first, stencil pieces separately, then sew. The first thing I did was measure the pillow I was going to cover. I bought this pillow from the Salvation Army Charity Store in a bed in a bag package that included two small pillows, a bolster pillow, and a full-size comforter. Since I have two pillows, I will be making two pillow covers. The second pillow will be made using another craft from the McCall's Annuals, so stay tuned to Budget Sew for that video. You may recognize the blue fabric that I chose. It's the same blue fabric as my Simplicity Crafting Jacket, Simplicity 4183. The link to that video with the jacket is at the top of the screen. I thought that I had used all this fabric and did not have a single remnant left, but it just reappeared in my fabric trunk. What a surprise it was to discover more fabric. When I sewed the crafting jacket, I thought that I didn't have enough fabric left for a belt, so I had to piece together a belt with the 10 scraps of fabric that I had left over from grading the jacket down to a smaller size. This jacket also appeared in my Vogue Pattern Haul video. The link to that video is at the top of the screen. The navy blue fabric was 150 centimeters wide and just over 3 meters long before I cut out the jacket. It's a woven polyester and I paid $4.99 for the entire piece of fabric at Value Village thrift stores. I chose the navy blue fabric for my pillows because it matches my Union Jack blanket and pillow on my couch. I used my chalk and tape measure to mark a square on my folded fabric that measured 18 inches by 18 inches or 42 centimeters square. One of these squares will be used for the crown pillow cover and the other will be used for another pillow cover. I used my 36 inch cutting ruler with handle and chalk to mark my cutting lines. My partner Brad's father gave this cutting ruler to him and I borrow it all the time. I find it very handy because of its long length, handle for easy lifting and square edge. Then I cut out my square using my Singer 9.5 inch Pro Series Bent Sewing Scissors. These fabric shears smoothly slice my fabric. One of the best Amazon.ca purchases I have ever made. I brushed off the additional chalk from the line that I drew too long. There's not much fabric left, but I'm sure I could squeeze out another project or two. I try to use every scrap of fabric that I have. I carefully place my patterns, making best use of the fabric while still ensuring the fabric pattern and nap are the same. I cut out two more squares of fabric, measuring 18 inches by 18 inches for the back of the cushions I chose this golden brown fabric because this fabric is the mate to the curtains and cushion covers that I already have in my living room. It has the same pattern but is a lighter gold but complementary fabric. I bought this golden brown fabric from the clearance section at Fabricland for super cheap. I made two pillow shams and a bed coverlet and the remaining fabric you see here are the remnants. 
All of my annuals recommend using stencil paper, but I didn't have any. Instead of buying stencil paper, I used MacTac or Home Deco self-adhesive roll because of its adhesive back will stick to the fabric and the vinyl front won't let paint leak through. This roll was $3 and measured 45 centimeters by two meters. I've covered boxes, binders, and lined cupboards with this stuff. It's fantastic. I placed my crown image on the back of the self-adhesive roll and cut a piece bigger than the size of the image. This roll has grid lines on the back to make cutting straight lines very easy. I found my crown image on Pixabay, a website that shares copyright free images. I'll post the link to the crown image I used on my website, budgetso.com, and in the description box of this video. There were so many crown images to choose from, but I chose this image because it's one color with clean lines that I can easily follow. The vinyl self-adhesive square kept rolling up, so I used items on my desk to flatten it, but the thread was just too light. It tipped over and rolled away. Maybe I should make some pattern weights for projects like this. I centered my image on the back of the self-adhesive vinyl and taped it down on all four sides. I did not want this image to shift once I started cutting it out. I used a box cutter to start cutting out this crown. I pressed hard enough to cut through both the paper and the self-adhesive roll. When cutting out your image, remember that the white pieces or the non-printed pieces are the ones you want to keep, so don't slice into the white. It's okay to cut into the colored or printed pieces because they end up in the garbage. Another very important tip is to use a sharp knife. I started out with a dull box cutter blade that had a chip in it, then switched to an X-Acto knife with a brand new blade. The dull blade left jagged edges that had to be cleaned up. The brand new blade easily sliced through the paper and the self-adhesive. What a difference the new blade made. In addition to the X-Acto knife, I used scissors to clean up the edges and to cut out the small circles. Remember to save the little white circles, the pearls, and the jewels, but the printed little circles can be thrown in the trash. The annual's instructions for cutting the stencil were Place stencil paper on glass or manila envelope. I placed my stencil on a piece of corrugated cardboard so that it would not cut into my table. The annual indicated that the knife will stick into the cardboard, but I didn't run into this problem. The annual continued, follow outlines with knife, cutting all the way through so that the cut shape will fall out easily. Knife should always point towards the cutout shape and be held at an angle to obtain a slightly beveled edge. This keeps paint from creeping under the stencil edges when printing. Since my self-adhesive roll is so thin, much thinner than stencil paper, I did not have to worry about a beveled edge. Always cut towards you, that is top to bottom. Keep turning stencil paper around so that this is possible. Make sure you keep your fingers and thumbs out of the way to prevent injury. The annual recommended to keep sharpening knife on a moist sharpening stone. 
If you accidentally cut into part of the self-adhesive roll that is not to be cut, don't worry. You can add another piece of adhesive over the top of the cut piece so that the paint will not leak through. That's one of the great things about using the self-adhesive roll in addition to its great low price. When cutting out the smaller pieces such as the jewels, I found it best to put them in a Ziploc bag so I wouldn't lose them. Some of the pieces were so tiny, I almost threw them out. Before I continue with the Victoria Day craft, please share this video with your friends and family. I would love to help others sew and upcycle on a budget and troubleshoot their favorite patterns. I also love sharing the treasures that I find at thrift shops. If you'd like to see more from Budget Sew, please subscribe and make sure that the bell is on so you receive a notification when I release a new video. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Budget Sew. Now back to the stenciling. As recommended by the annual, I stenciled my pillow cover before sewing it into one piece. I cleaned up the edges of the stencil with my tiny scissors to make sure that all the lines were crisp and clean. Once my crown image was fully cut out from the self-adhesive roll, I applied it to the navy blue fabric. I took my time with this step. I wanted the crown to be centered on the pillow so I used my tape measure to ensure the optimal placement. Once I had the perfect spot for the stencil, I peeled back one corner on the backing of the self-adhesive and then pressed the sticky back stencil to the fabric. I took my time with this step because I didn't want to tear any part of my stencil or move it too much. The annual has a section in the stenciling instructions about mixing paint colors. It says, use plate palette, or any hard surface. Little color is needed. Amount on the tip of a knife will go a long way. Read directions carefully, which come with stencil paints. Some textile paints need to be mixed with Extendor, which is a necessary chemical ingredient. Never mix more paint than needed for painting at one time, as fabric paint dries rapidly. I've used fabric paints in the past, but I did not need to add any Extendor. The paint was ready to go in the bottle. I received jewel tone fabric paints as a Christmas gift as a child, and I used iron-on transfers as templates to apply the paint on t-shirts and tablecloths. Some of the stencils were Aunt Martha brand stencils that included fuzzy ducks working on household activities with the days of the week in the background. I spent hours painting until every drop of fabric paint was used up. I had so much fun with those projects. What a wonderful Christmas gift. After the large section of the stencil was stuck down on the fabric, it was time to apply the smaller pieces to the stencil. I removed the crown's jewels that I had cut out of the self-adhesive and arranged them on the crown. Once I knew what jewels went where, I pulled off the sticky backing and pressed them onto the fabric. 
Pulling the backing off these adhesive pieces was a bit difficult because they were really small. I had to fold the edge of the stones in order to get a gap big enough for me to remove the backing. Make sure to press down all the edges and small pieces of the template to ensure that the paint does not leak under the edge. The last thing I wanted was a blurry crown. I liked that the crown I picked had jewels around the band because it added more detail and elegance to the design. I didn't have any fabric paint, so I used acrylic paint instead. I used Deco Arts Crafters Acrylic Paint in Spun Gold. I bought a small bottle of 4 fluid ounces or 118 milliliters for $2 at Dollarama, a Canadian dollar store. The bottle said, use this value priced metallic finished acrylic to paint general craft and home decor projects. Shake well, apply with a brush or sponge. Water-based, permanent, fast drying, and intermixable. Soap and water cleanup. Even though this paint was not a fabric paint, it was perfect for my project. It's a permanent, water-based, easy cleanup paint at a great price. I used a stencil paintbrush that I bought when I was in college. I bought this low Cornell stencil brush from Michaels, a craft supply store, when I was working on an imitation impressionist painting using the pointillism technique. I painted a sunset on the water using one primary color, blue, and one secondary and complementary color, orange. It was my first attempt at a real painting. A stencil brush looks like a regular brush, but unlike other brushes, it has a flat top, which makes it perfect for dabbing and swirling paint over the stencil without the paint seeping underneath. This brush was perfect for painting and stenciling because the bristles were stiff, in a round shape, and perfect for dabbing. The annual's instructions for printing were Place fabric on white blotter In my case, on the cardboard Tape Lay stencil where you want it Tape Or hold firmly with hand My self-adhesive roll was already stuck down on the fabric Dig brush into color and rub off on a piece of paper until almost dry Work paint into fabric through stencil opening Hold brush upright. With rotating motion, work from edge of opening towards center. Work well into fabric. After the first coat of paint was applied and dried, I added a second coat. The annual said, do not load too much paint onto the brush if you wish to make area solid. Better to repeat until the entire area is covered. I ended up adding three coats of paint for full coverage. As you can see here, I dab my paint on the fabric. Do not brush it on because it will bleed under the edge of the template and create a fuzzy outline. Try to keep the outline as clean as possible for the best results. After the three coats of paint had dried, I removed my self-adhesive stencil. I did this very slowly and carefully because I did not want to accidentally rip off any paint. I started in one corner and peeled back the adhesive. I folded over the self-adhesive stencil so that it stuck to itself and did not flop back down and re-adhere to the fabric. I went very slowly and I used my knife and then my little scissors, which I bought at Dollarama, to slice the paint away from the stencil. I didn't have to cut it away everywhere, only in a few spots, but I did use the little scissors to lift up the edges of the self-adhesive roll to peel it off.
The annual's instructions recommended allowing the finished work to dry more than 24 hours and not more than three days. Then place fabric on ironing board, face up. Cover with a dry cloth and press for three minutes at 300 degrees Fahrenheit or at linen temperature on an adjustable iron. A steam iron may be used. Turn material and press back with pressing cloth, dampened if desired. Fabrics which require a low heat should be set by pressing them a few minutes longer than directed at a lower temperature. The annual also has a section in the instructions about the care of stencils and brushes. It says, do not wash stencils after each using, as cleaning wears edges. Turn each stencil face down on blotter with a soft rag and a little cleaning fluid, gently wipe back clean. Store with a sheet of paper between stencils. Then it talks about brushes. Wash brushes in cleaning fluid dry well. It is desirable to have a separate brush for each color. For example, a red brush may be used for all shades of red. Brushes should not be washed more than necessary. A little paint in the bristles helps keep them stiff. I used a water-based paint. My brush washed clean under warm water. I used my small scissors to poke under the edges of the little diamonds, jewels, stones, and pearls to remove the self-adhesive. The annual has recommendations about choosing the color of fabrics. It says, textile colors, being transparent, are most effective on light or medium backgrounds. If dark color material is to be used, add white to colors to make them opaque. White does not penetrate fiber of fabric sufficiently to give secure anchorage. Therefore, it will not be as washable as the other colors. I was very pleased with the coverage of my gold acrylic paint, and I did not need to add any white paint to the gold to cover the navy blue fabric. To sew the pillow cover front to the back, I used a brand new vintage Lightning Zephyr 12 to 14 inch black invisible zipper that I bought at Good Value Thrift Stores for 25 cents. This zipper and five other vintage invisible zippers were still in their original packages. I bought four black, one white, and one bright purple zipper. The package advertised that these zippers are flexible with a nylon coil. They're lightweight, yet as strong as metal. They launder an iron-like nylon and have a memory lock slider. My favorite advertising point is that they're magically self-healing. The instructions on the zipper package are fantastic. They said, turn fabric right side up. Open zipper. Place face side down with left tape on right seam allowance. Coil along seam line. Zipper tape toward cut edge of fabric. 
place stop three quarters of an inch from the top of the fabric to allow for a 5 eighths of an inch seam allowance. The zipper instructions did not say I had to do this, but I pinned then hand basted the zipper in place. I find that if I don't baste it in place, it ends up going in incorrectly and I have to unpick my work and re-sew it. Maybe I need more practice sewing zippers in place. I used black Coates and Clark all-purpose dual duty plus thread to base the zipper in place. I chose black thread to match the zipper just in case I machine sewed over my basting thread and couldn't unpick it. I usually use a bright color basting thread so I remember to remove it, but I chose the black thread to match. I like that the zipper package showed for larger illustrated instructions plus further tips on successfully applying the Lightning Nylon Invisible Fastener right to Lightning Educational Service at 50 Niagara Street in St. Catharines, Ontario. Another nice thing about the zipper package was that it had laundering and ironing instructions. It said for iron temperatures higher than steam settings, protect coils with a press cloth. Lightning Zephyr is unaffected by normal laundering and dry cleaning. The color will not chip, wear, or wash off. The nylon fastener should be closed when laundered, dry cleaned, or ironed, or when being put through a wringer. Should zipper become hard running after washing or dry cleaning, lubricate coils with beeswax, soap, or commercial zipper ease product. Then I hand basted the invisible zipper into the back pillow cover. The zipper instructions were, straighten right zipper tape and place face side down on left seam allowance, fabric right side up, top tape ends aligned. At the sewing machine, I sewed the invisible zipper in place. The instruction said, lower foot, turning top stop and coil upright in groove with finger. Stitch slowly until foot touches slider. Back stitch carefully. I used my invisible zipper foot. The package for my zipper said to ensure safe and satisfactory results, use this special lightning foot attachment, which can be adjusted properly for stitching in the lightning nylon invisible zipper. The instructions continued, straighten right zipper tape and place face down on the left seam allowance, fabric right side up, top tape ends aligned. On stretchy fabrics, pin end of zipper for extra stability. Position foot over tape, top stop and coil upright in other groove. Stitch as in step A. Stitching must not catch any part of the turned up tape and coil. If it has, remove these stitches and carefully re-stitch. Straighten out zipper and fabric right side up. Finger press fabric away from coil. Carefully close zipper. If zipper tape shows in seams with normal tension, adjust foot so needle is closer to coil and re-stitch. No need to remove initial stitches. I did it! My zipper slides open and close smoothly. I'm thrilled! Then I sewed the rest of the zipper seam below the zipper. The instructions said, to join seam below zipper, slide foot to left of needle. If your foot is of the two needle hole type, snap off slipper part. Lower needle into fabric three to four stitches above end of previous stitching. 
and as close as possible alongside it. Make sure needle does not catch end of zipper tape. Lower foot in by hand operating machine, carefully stitch remaining seam closed using power after first inch of stitching. My next step was to pin the pillow cover's remaining seams closed. I placed my fabric squares right sides together, lined up the edges as best as possible, and pinned all the way around the three open sides. I really enjoyed this craft. I've never done stenciling with self-adhesive before, so it was an exciting challenge. I liked that I used items from around the house instead of buying brand new products. I used two remnant fabrics, gold paint from Dollarama, self-adhesive that lined my bathroom cupboard, and a stenciling brush from college. I'm thrifty and budget conscious. Another thing that made me smile about this project was that I still have some of the golden brown fabric left over for another project. I wonder what I'll make next. I'll be sure to show you here on Budget Sew. So. Once the seams were pinned, they should be sewn in place. Then I sewed the three remaining seams. I started at one end of the zipper and sewed around to the other end of the zipper, pivoting at the corners. Before sewing the sides, remember to open the zipper, otherwise you won't be able to turn the pillow the right side out. Yes, I made that mistake and had to unpick part of the side seam to unzip the zipper. Once it was open, I re-sewed the unpicked part of the seam. After the seams had been sewn, I clipped the corners and trimmed the seam allowances. My next step was to press the seam allowances open. After that, I turned the pillow the right side out and inserted my gold square pillow from the Salvation Army. Here is the finished pillow. my crown pillow Victoria Day craft. Please like and share this video with your friends and family. If you'd like to see more from Budget Sew, please subscribe. And if you'd like to stay up to date with Budget Sew, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Budget Sew. Thanks for watching. See you next time.